Management of Endometrial Hyperplasia Green Tap Guideline Number 67 Royal College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists and British Society for Gynecological Endoscopy Joint Guideline February 2016 Introduction and Background Epidemiology Endometrial hyperplasia is defined as irregular proliferation of the endometrial glands with an increase in the gland to stroma ratio when compared with proliferative endometrium. Endometrial cancer is the most common gynecological malignancy in the Western world and endometrial hyperplasia is its precursor. The incidence of endometrial hyperplasia is estimated to be at least three times higher than endometrial cancer and if left untreated, it can progress to cancer. The most common presentation of endometrial hyperplasia is abnormal uterine bleeding. This includes heavy menstrual bleeding, intermenstrual bleeding, irregular bleeding, unscheduled bleeding on hormone replacement therapy or HRT, and postmenopausal bleeding. What are the risk factors for endometrial hyperplasia? Endometrial hyperplasia is often associated with multiple identifiable risk factors and assessment should aim to identify and monitor these factors. Endometrial hyperplasia develops when estrogen, unopposed by progesterone, stimulates endometrial cell growth by binding to estrogen receptors in the nuclei of endometrial cells. Known risk factors for endometrial hyperplasia include increased body mass index or BMI with excessive peripheral conversion of androgens in adipose tissue to estrogen, anovulation associated with the perimenopause or polycystic ovary syndrome or PCOS, estrogen secreting ovarian tumors for example, granulosa cell tumors with up to 40% prevalence of endometrial hyperplasia and drug-induced endometrial stimulation, for example, the use of systemic estrogen replacement therapy or long-term tamoxifen. A Cochrane meta-analysis found that unopposed estrogen replacement therapy is associated with an increased incidence of hyperplasia at all doses and is not recommended for use in women with a uterus. While estrogenic stimulation of the endometrium is believed to be the main etiological risk factor for developing the condition, other elements such as immunosuppression and infection may also be involved. A retrospective analysis of 45 renal graft recipients with abnormal bleeding, found a two-fold increased incidence of endometrial hyperplasia. How should endometrial hyperplasia be classified? The revised 2014 World Health Organization or WHO classification is recommended. This separates endometrial hyperplasia into two groups based upon the presence of cytological atypia. Hyperplasia without atypia and atypical hyperplasia. The 2014 revised WHO classification simply separates endometrial hyperplasia into two groups based upon the presence or absence of cytological atypia, hyperplasia without atypia, and atypical hyperplasia. The complexity of architecture is no longer part of the classification. What diagnostic and surveillance methods are available for endometrial hyperplasia? Diagnosis of endometrial hyperplasia requires histological examination of the endometrial tissue. Endometrial surveillance should include endometrial sampling by outpatient endometrial biopsy. Diagnostic hysteroscopy should be considered to facilitate or obtain an endometrial sample especially where outpatient sampling fails or is non-diagnostic. Transvaginal ultrasound may have a role in diagnosing endometrial hyperplasia in pre- and postmenopausal women.
direct visualization and biopsy of the uterine cavity using hysteroscopy should be undertaken where endometrial hyperplasia has been diagnosed within a polyp or other discrete focal lesion. There is insufficient evidence evaluating computerized tomography or CT, diffusion-weighted magnetic resonance imaging or MRI, or biomarkers as aids in the management of endometrial hyperplasia and their use is not routinely recommended. Endometrial hyperplasia is often suspected in women presenting with abnormal uterine bleeding. However, confirmation of diagnosis requires histological analysis of endometrial tissue specimens obtained either by using miniature outpatient suction devices designed to blindly abrade and or aspirate endometrial tissue from the uterine cavity or by inpatient endometrial sampling, such as dilatation and curettage performed under general anesthesia. Endometrial sampling is also fundamental in monitoring regression, persistence, or progression. Outpatient endometrial biopsy is convenient and has high overall accuracy for diagnosing endometrial cancer. Despite a negative biopsy result, 2% of women will still have endometrial hyperplasia. A transvaginal ultrasound scan or TVS that detects an irregularity of the endometrial profile or an abnormal double-layer endometrial thickness measurement would give further reason to perform an endometrial biopsy in women with postmenopausal bleeding. Systematic reviews have suggested a cutoff of 3 mm or 4 mm for ruling out endometrial cancer and have shown that the probability of cancer is reduced to less than 1% when the endometrial thickness is less than the cutoff. However, a larger cutoff value has been suggested for women taking hormone replacement therapy or tamoxifen whether presenting with abnormal uterine bleeding or asymptomatic. The role of ultrasound in premenopausal women is restricted to identifying structural abnormalities as there seems to be an overlap between normal endometrial thickness and that caused by endometrial disease. For women with PCOS and absent withdrawal bleeds or abnormal uterine bleeding, a transvaginal ultrasound scan should be considered as advised by RCOG guidance. A prospective study of 56 women with PCOS found that no women with an endometrial thickness of less than 7 mm had endometrial hyperplasia. As a result, the RCOG guidance supports the conclusion that below this cutoff, endometrial hyperplasia is unlikely. Hysteroscopy with additional endometrial assessment may be necessary if abnormal bleeding persists or if intrauterine structural abnormalities such as polyps are suspected on transvaginal ultrasound scan or endometrial biopsy. Up to 10% of endometrial pathology can be missed even with inpatient endometrial sampling. However, in premenopausal women who wish to preserve their fertility, repeated curettage should be minimized to reduce the incidence of Asherman's syndrome. Hysteroscopy can detect focal lesions such as polyps that may be missed by blind sampling. Hysteroscopy can be used to facilitate or complement the endometrial biopsy, especially where sampling is not possible or is non-diagnostic. Directed biopsies can be taken through the operating channel of a continuous flow operating hysteroscope or blindly through the outer sheet after removing the telescope. Diagnostic hysteroscopy can be conducted in the outpatient setting using miniature hysteroscopes and without the need for anesthesia or vaginal instrumentation. Hysteroscopy is more accurate in detecting than excluding endometrial disease and has a higher accuracy for endometrial cancer than endometrial hyperplasia.
CT or MRI to aid the diagnosis of hyperplasia is not commonly used. It is reported that a preoperative CT scan of women who have atypical endometrial hyperplasia or grade 1 endometrial cancer could alter management in 4.3% of cases. It is an expensive test, and because of the radiation associated with its application, it should not be routinely recommended. Diffusion-weighted MRI may help in identifying women with invasive cancer, and it has the future potential to diagnose endometrial hyperplasia and other endometrial lesions. Thus, it could become a useful technology in women undergoing surveillance for atypical endometrial hyperplasia as a predictor for malignant change, but more evidence is needed. How should endometrial hyperplasia without atypia be managed? What should the initial management of hyperplasia without atypia be? Women should be informed that the risk of endometrial hyperplasia without atypia progressing to endometrial cancer is less than 5% over 20 years and that the majority of cases of endometrial hyperplasia without atypia will regress spontaneously during follow-up. Reversible risk factors such as obesity and the use of HRT should be identified and addressed if possible. Observation alone with follow-up endometrial biopsies to ensure disease regression can be considered, especially when identifiable risk factors can be reversed. However, women should be informed that treatment with progestogens has a higher disease regression rate compared with observation alone. Progestogen treatment is indicated in women who fail to regress following observation alone and symptomatic women with abnormal uterine bleeding. There are several reversible risk factors for endometrial hyperplasia. The slow progression of endometrial hyperplasia without atypia to cancer offers a window of opportunity to address these factors. Obesity is a major risk factor and advising obese women to lose weight is recommended. Up to 10% of severely obese women could harbor asymptomatic endometrial hyperplasia and bariatric surgery may reduce this risk. Clinicians should take a detailed history of any use of exogenous hormones that includes both prescribed hormone replacement therapy preparations and over-the-counter preparations that may contain high-potency estrogens. Clinicians should be aware that non-prescribed estrogen intake may take various forms. The indication and type of combined HRT regimen should be reviewed, especially as regards the relative dosages of estrogen and progestogen, as well as the mode of administration of these hormones. A manipulation of the combined HRT regimen alone is often sufficient in inducing regression of endometrial hyperplasia without atypia. This is particularly important for postmenopausal women as they have a higher risk of developing endometrial hyperplasia and cancer because of unopposed extraovarian estrogenic stimulation. Ongoing tamoxifen treatment should be reviewed in conjunction with a women's oncologist. Anovulatory cycles are often casual of endometrial hyperplasia in women who have PCOS or polycystic ovary syndrome, or who are perimenopausal, and they are likely to regress to normal once women with PCOS resume ovulation or perimenopausal women reach the menopause. A baseline pelvic ultrasound should be arranged to exclude the possibility of an estrogen-secreting granulosa cell tumor of the ovary. If an ovarian cyst is detected on pelvic ultrasound, then blood for ovarian tumor markers should be obtained. In the absence of other identifiable risk factors for endometrial hyperplasia, a serum inhibin level together with an estradiol level may be considered if a granulosa cell tumor is suspected.
progestogen treatment appears to have higher regression rates of 89 to 96 percent compared with observation only 74.2 to 81 percent and it may reduce the risk of progression to cancer and the need for hysterectomy. In view of a high spontaneous regression rate and uncommon progression to more severe disease, it is uncertain whether medical management is appropriate for all women. Many women are diagnosed with endometrial hyperplasia while undergoing investigation of abnormal uterine bleeding. Thus, treatment may be required on symptomatic grounds. Because of the risk of progression to cancer, women who fail to regress with observation alone should be treated and followed up to ensure regression. Observation alone is expected to fail where there is no identifiable reversible risk factor causing the endometrial hyperplasia. What should the first-line medical treatment of hyperplasia without atypia be? Both continuous oral and local intrauterine or levonorgestrel releasing intrauterine system or LNG IUS progestogens are effective in achieving regression of endometrial hyperplasia without atypia. The levonorgestrel releasing intrauterine system or LNG IUS should be the first line of medical treatment because compared with oral progestogens, it has a higher disease regression rate with a more favorable bleeding profile and it is associated with fewer adverse effects. Continuous progestogens should be used, such as medroxyprogesterone of 10 to 20 mg per day or norethesterone of 10 to 15 mg per day for women who decline the LNG IUS. Psychical progestogens should not be used because they are less effective in inducing regression of endometrial hyperplasia without atypia compared with continuous oral progestogens or the LNG IUS. Progestogens have been advocated to treat endometrial hyperplasia because they modify the proliferative effects of estrogen on the endometrium. Oral progestogens can have significant adverse effects and norethesterone at a high dose has similar contraindications to combine contraceptive pills. The intrauterine release of the levonorgestrel minimizes the systemic absorption of the hormone and aids compliance by reducing adverse effects. The LNG IUS achieves a higher concentration of levonorgestrel at the level of the endometrium compared with oral progestogens. In women of reproductive age, the levonorgestrel releasing intrauterine system can also provide effective contraception and it is recommended as first-line treatment for heavy menstrual bleeding. Women treated with a LNG IUS compared with oral progestogens were less likely to need hysterectomy during follow-up. What should the duration of treatment and follow-up of hyperplasia without atypia be? Treatment with oral progestogens or the LNG IUS should be for a minimum of 6 months in order to induce histological regression of endometrial hyperplasia without atypia. If adverse effects are tolerable and fertility is not desired, women should be encouraged to retain the LNG IUS for up to 5 years as this reduces the risk of relapse, especially if it alleviates abnormal uterine bleeding symptoms. Endometrial surveillance incorporating outpatient endometrial biopsy is recommended after a diagnosis of hyperplasia without atypia. Endometrial surveillance should be arranged at a minimum of six monthly intervals, although review schedules should be individualized and responsive to changes in a woman's clinical condition. At least two consecutive six-monthly negative biopsies should be obtained prior to discharge. Women should be advised to seek a further referral if abnormal vaginal bleeding recurs after completion of treatment because this may indicate disease relapse. In women at higher risk of relapse, such as women with a BMI of 35 or greater,
or those treated with oral progestogens, six monthly endometrial biopsies are recommended. Once two consecutive negative endometrial biopsies have been obtained, then long-term follow-up should be considered with annual endometrial biopsies. Higher regression rates have been shown from increasing the duration of medical treatment from 3 to 6 months. Between 3 and 6 months, the regression rates improved for the LNG IUS from 84% to 100% and for oral medroxyprogesterone from 50% to 64%. Relapse was common with 33%. In women at higher risk of disease relapse, persistence or progression such as those with a BMI of 35 or greater or treated with short courses of oral progestogens, biopsies at six monthly intervals for at least two years should be considered and long-term follow-up on an annual basis thereafter. In view of the risk of relapse of endometrial hyperplasia, it is reasonable to continue with LNG IUS treatment despite a regression of the hyperplasia. In the absence of adverse effects, the final decision to persist with treatment or remove the device should be made in consultation with the woman and according to her preferences. If adverse effects are tolerable and fertility is not desired, women should be encouraged to retain the LNG IUS for the 5-year duration, especially if it alleviates abnormal uterine bleeding symptoms. For oral progestogens, there is evidence from randomized trials that six months of therapy is more efficacious than three months. Cessation of oral progestogens after three to six months of therapy may relate to fears over potential adverse effects arising from chronic administration of high-dose continuous oral progestogens and compliance issues. In the absence of safety and efficacy data, the routine use of longer-term oral regimens cannot be supported. Women experiencing abnormal vaginal bleeding after the end of treatment should be advised to seek a further referral as this may signify relapse. In summary, there is evidence from randomized trials that treatment with progestogens should last for at least 6 months. If endometrial hyperplasia persists for 12 months despite treatment, the risk of underlying cancer is high and the chances of disease regression are low such that hysterectomy is advised. A BMI of 35 or greater or treatment of endometrial hyperplasia without atypia by oral progestogens carries a higher risk of relapse and long-term follow-up may be warranted. Annual endometrial biopsies can be considered for these high-risk women, but follow-up schedules should be individualized. They should take into account the baseline cancer risk, medical comorbidities, presence of abnormal bleeding, and treatment factors such as response, tolerance, and compliance, as well as the wishes of the patient. When is surgical management appropriate for women with endometrial hyperplasia without atypia? Hysterectomy should not be considered as a first-line treatment for hyperplasia without atypia because progestogen therapy induces histological and symptomatic remission in the majority of women and avoids the morbidity associated with major surgery. Hysterectomy is indicated in women not wanting to preserve their fertility when progression to atypical hyperplasia occurs during follow-up or there is no histological regression of hyperplasia despite 12 months of treatment or there is relapse of endometrial hyperplasia after completing progestogen treatment or there is persistence of bleeding symptoms or the woman declines to undergo endometrial surveillance or comply with medical treatment. Postmenopausal women requiring surgical management for endometrial hyperplasia without atypia should be offered a bilateral salpingo oophorectomy together with a total hysterectomy. For premenopausal women, the decision to remove the ovaries should be individualized. However, bilateral salpingectomy should be considered as this may reduce the risk of a future ovarian malignancy.
a laparoscopic approach to total hysterectomy is preferable to an abdominal approach as it is associated with a shorter hospital stay, less post-operative pain, and quicker recovery. Endometrial ablation is not recommended for the treatment of endometrial hyperplasia because complete and persistent endometrial destruction cannot be ensured and intrauterine adhesion formation may preclude future endometrial histological surveillance. Supracervical hysterectomy should be avoided to ensure that all premalignant disease is eliminated. A laparoscopic approach may be preferable to the abdominal approach for women with atypical hyperplasia or stage 1 endometrial cancer as it is associated with a shorter hospital stay, less post-operative pain, and quicker recovery. Endometrial ablation has been used as an alternative surgical approach to treat endometrial hyperplasia without atypia and is also effective in reducing heavy menstrual loss. However, complete endometrial destruction cannot be guaranteed and regeneration of ablated endometrial tissue may occur. Subsequent endometrial assessment with hysteroscopy or endometrial biopsy may be compromised because of intrauterine adhesions. Hence, this method cannot be recommended routinely. How should a typical hyperplasia be managed? What should the initial management of a typical hyperplasia be? Women with atypical hyperplasia should undergo a total hysterectomy because of the risk of underlying malignancy or progression to cancer. A laparoscopic approach to total hysterectomy is preferable to an abdominal approach as it is associated with a shorter hospital stay, less post-operative pain, and quicker recovery. There is no benefit from intraoperative frozen section analysis of the endometrium or routine lymphadenectomy. Postmenopausal women with atypical hyperplasia should be offered bilateral salpingo oophorectomy together with the total hysterectomy. For premenopausal women, the decision to remove the ovaries should be individualized. However, bilateral salpingectomy should be considered as this may reduce the risk of a future ovarian malignancy. Endometrial ablation is not recommended because complete and persistent endometrial destruction cannot be ensured and intrauterine adhesion formation may preclude endometrial histological surveillance. The risk of developing endometrial cancer is highest in atypical hyperplasia. Atypical hyperplasia has also been associated with a rate of concomitant carcinoma of up to 43% in women undergoing hysterectomy. Due to the risk of underlying malignancy or progression to cancer, a total hysterectomy is advised. The method chosen for hysterectomy should allow assessment for further disease if necessary. Minimal access techniques do allow staging and there is some evidence to suggest that they are beneficial when done by appropriately trained surgeons. There was no difference in major complications between laparoscopic and abdominal approaches in a randomized trial comparing total laparoscopic hysterectomy with total abdominal hysterectomy via a midline incision. However, laparoscopic hysterectomy was superior in terms of a shorter hospital stay, less pain, and quicker resumption of daily activities. Due to the risk of disseminating malignancy, morcellation of the uterus should be avoided. Supracervical hysterectomy should not be performed. Intraoperative frozen analysis of the endometrium is not a reliable indicator of final pathology in women with a preoperative diagnosis of atypical hyperplasia. Lymphadenectomy should not be routinely performed in atypical hyperplasia because this would result in unnecessary surgical risk for the majority of women. Although endometrial cancer has been reported in 43% of cases during hysterectomy, 
the cancer was usually early stage with low risk of lymphovascular disease. Due to the risk of underlying malignancy, bilateral salpingo oophorectomy should be performed in all peri and postmenopausal women undergoing hysterectomy for atypical hyperplasia. However, the evidence is less clear about premenopausal women diagnosed with atypical hyperplasia and the risk of surgical menopause have to be balanced against the risk of underlying cancer and the need for further surgery to remove the ovaries. Bilateral salpingo oophorectomy is associated with increased mortality in women aged less than 50 years who had hysterectomy for benign disease. Premenopausal women who undergo hysterectomy and bilateral salpingo oophorectomy for endometrial hyperplasia should consider the use of estrogen replacement in the absence of contraindication to its use until the age of natural menopause to minimize the risk of surgical menopause. As an alternative to hysterectomy, endometrial ablation and resection has also been reported. Although complete endometrial destruction cannot be guaranteed and regeneration of ablated endometrial tissue may occur. As with hysterectomy, this is not a fertility sparing procedure and intrauterine adhesion formation can render future endometrial surveillance with hysteroscopy and or endometrial biopsy problematic. How should women with atypical hyperplasia who wish to preserve their fertility or who are not suitable for surgery be managed? Women wishing to retain their fertility should be counseled about the risk of underlying malignancy and subsequent progression to endometrial cancer. Pre-treatment investigations should aim to rule out invasive endometrial cancer or coexisting ovarian cancer. Histology, imaging, and tumor marker results should be reviewed in a multidisciplinary meeting and a plan for management and ongoing endometrial surveillance formulated. First-line treatment with the LNG-IUS should be recommended with oral progestogens as a second-best alternative. Once fertility is no longer required, hysterectomy should be offered in view of the high risk of disease relapse. Fertility-sparing therapy has been advocated for women who desire future fertility or who have medical comorbidities precluding surgical management. However, Women need careful counseling of the risk involved with this option. Coexistent or progression to endometrial cancer, coexistent ovarian cancer, metastatic disease, and death. In a systematic review of uncontrolled observational studies of women with atypical hyperplasia, the risk of coexisting ovarian cancer was up to 4%. The risk of progression to higher than stage 1 endometrial cancer was about 2% and the risk of metastatic disease and death was about 0.5%. Investigations prior to fertility sparing treatment should be undertaken, and these include tumor markers such as CA125 and imaging with transvaginal ultrasound scan and or MRI scan to rule out coexisting ovarian cancer and invasive endometrial cancer. Several hormonal therapies have been used to treat this group of women, and these include oral progestogens, the LNG IUS, aromatase inhibitors, and gonadotropin releasing hormone agonist. A meta analysis of observational studies of fertility sparing treatment for women with atypical hyperplasia reported summary rates for disease regression of 85.6% a relapse rate of 26%, and a life birth rate of 26.3%. In summary, fertility sparing management of atypical hyperplasia is possible, with one quarter of women achieving a live birth. It is essential that initial diagnosis is confirmed on formal hysteroscopy to minimize the chance of missing cancer. The optimal treatment regimen is also ill-defined. In addition, the length of follow-up after fertility sparing treatment has been short such that the risk of relapse in the longer term is uncertain.
careful counseling about the risks of fertility sparing treatment is of paramount importance together with pre-treatment workup to rule out advanced endometrial or ovarian cancer. Because of the rarity and complexity of this clinical scenario, gynecologists should seek gynecological oncology multidisciplinary advice where the available histology, imaging, and tumor markers are examined. The advice should include a plan for endometrial biopsies and follow-up together with a maximum recommended duration of fertility sparing treatment before a hysterectomy is performed. How should women with atypical hyperplasia not undergoing hysterectomy be followed up? Routine endometrial surveillance should include endometrial biopsy. Review schedules should be individualized and be responsive to changes in a woman's clinical condition. Review intervals should be every three months until two consecutive negative biopsies are obtained. In asymptomatic women with a uterus, an evidence of histological disease regression based upon a minimum of two consecutive negative endometrial biopsies, long-term follow-up with endometrial biopsy every 6 to 12 months is recommended until a hysterectomy is performed. The follow-up should be customized to each woman taking into account baseline risk factors, associated symptoms, and response to treatment. Obesity is associated with a higher risk of failure to regress and relapse and should be taken into consideration when arranging follow-up. This is best decided in the context of a gynecological oncology multidisciplinary meeting and women who decline or are unfit to undergo a hysterectomy can be considered for discussion. The minimum investigations required to monitor the endometrium during follow-up include a detailed history for the presence of symptoms and signs suggestive of progressive disease, pelvic examination, and an endometrial biopsy. Hysteroscopy should be considered where an endometrial biopsy cannot be satisfactorily obtained or where sampling is non-diagnostic. Transvaginal ultrasound scan has a role in ruling out ovarian disease if this has not already been performed although assessment of endometrial thickness is unlikely to be useful in view of the absence of validated reference ranges and the difficulty in obtaining accurate measurements with the livernorgestrel intrauterine system in place. There are no data to support the routine use of MRI or CT during follow-up. The optimal follow-up schedule is unknown. Most clinicians would recommend endometrial evaluation every three months initially until two consecutive negative biopsies are obtained. Failure of atypical endometrial hyperplasia to regress is a worrying sign for underlying endometrial cancer. If fertility sparing therapy fails to induce regression of atypical hyperplasia by 12 months or there is evidence of progression to cancer, women should be strongly recommended to undergo hysterectomy. The risk of relapse is especially high in the first two years from diagnosis. If relapse occurs during follow-up, women should also be advised to undergo hysterectomy as it is often associated with endometrial cancer at the final hysterectomy specimen. If this is not possible or decline, a further cycle of progestogen treatment can be attempted. In a study of 33 women with relapse atypical hyperplasia, 85% regressed following retreatment with oral medroxyprogesterone given for 6 months. Beyond 2 years, in asymptomatic women with a uterus and histologically regressed disease, Recourse to annual follow-up with endometrial biopsy was advised. How should endometrial hyperplasia be managed in women wishing to conceive? Disease regression should be achieved on at least one endometrial sample before women attempt to conceive. Women with endometrial hyperplasia who wish to conceive should be referred to a fertility specialist to discuss the options for attempting conception further assessment, 
and appropriate treatment. Assisted reproduction may be considered as the live birth rate is higher and it may prevent relapse compared with women who attempt natural conception. Prior to assisted reproduction, regression of endometrial hyperplasia should be achieved as this is associated with higher implantation and clinical pregnancy rates. Once regression of the endometrial hyperplasia is achieved, women can be advised to attempt natural conception. However, as a hyperplastic endometrium may predispose women to infertility, an early referral for fertility specialist consultation can be offered as per national recommendations. Obese women should aim for a BMI of less than 30. The live birth rate for women appear to be higher with assisted reproductive technology compared with natural conception following regression of atypical hyperplasia or well-differentiated endometrial cancer. Immediate assisted reproductive technology avoids a prolonged interval of time without progestogen treatment, which could cause women to relapse. A decision to initiate assisted reproduction immediately following cessation of progestogen treatment should be made within a multidisciplinary team setting, taking into account risk of disease progression and fertility prospects. HRT, or hormone replacement therapy, and endometrial hyperplasia. Systemic estrogen-only hormone replacement therapy should not be used in women with a uterus. All women taking HRT should be encouraged to report any unscheduled vaginal bleeding promptly. Women with endometrial hyperplasia taking a sequential HRT preparation who wish to continue HRT should be advised to change to continuous progestogen intake using the LNG IUS or a continuous combined hormone replacement therapy preparation. Subsequent management should be as described in the preceding sections of the guideline. Women with endometrial hyperplasia taking a continuous combined preparation who wish to continue hormone replacement therapy should have their need to continue hormone replacement therapy reviewed. Discuss the limitations of the available evidence regarding the optimal progestogen regimen in this context. Consider using the LNG IUS as a source of progestogen replacement. Subsequent management should be as described in the preceding sections of the guideline. Consider using the LNG IUS as a source of progestogen replacement. Subsequent management should be as described in the preceding sections of the guideline. A Cochrane review of randomized trials has shown a significantly increased risk of hyperplasia with unopposed estrogen replacement therapy for 2 to 3 years with evidence of a dose response relationship. The addition of a progestogen, a minimum of 1 mg per day norethisterone or 1.5 mg per day of medroxyprogesterone to the unopposed estrogen replacement therapy resulted in fewer cases of endometrial hyperplasia when either sequential or continuous combined HRT regimens were adopted. The Cochrane Review pointed towards a reduced cumulative endometrial hyperplasia prevalence at three years of follow-up with continuous combined hormone replacement therapy compared with sequential regimens. An observational study included 2,028 women who at entry point were either taking sequential HRT or were not on HRT. All women were given or switched to continuous combined HRT and endometrial response was assessed 9 months later. The study showed no increase in the risk of endometrial hyperplasia with continuous combined HRT and showed conversion of the endometrium back to normal in women who had hyperplasia on sequential HRT at entry to the study. A further study showed similar findings and included 22 women with hyperplasia with or without atypia at entry. All cases reverted back to normal histology 
within 6 months of continuous combined HRT treatment. Stopping sequential combined HRT may be sufficient to induce regression of endometrial hyperplasia. How should endometrial hyperplasia be managed in women on adjuvant treatment for breast cancer? What is the risk of developing endometrial hyperplasia on adjuvant treatment for breast cancer? Women taking tamoxifen should be informed about the increased risk of developing endometrial hyperplasia and cancer. They should be encouraged to report any abnormal vaginal bleeding or discharge promptly. Women taking aromatase inhibitors such as anastrozole, exemestane, and letrozole should be informed that these medications are not known to increase the risk of endometrial hyperplasia and cancer. Tamoxifen is a selective estrogen receptor modulator that inhibits proliferation of breast cancer by competitive antagonism at estrogen receptors. However, it has a partial agonist action on other tissues, including the vagina and the uterus. This estrogenic effect may promote the development of fibroids, endometrial polyps, and hyperplasia, and increase the risk of endometrial cancer. The risk increases with both dose and duration of treatment. Women taking tamoxifen should be informed of this risk and advised to contact their doctor promptly if they experience abnormal vaginal bleeding or discharge. The ability of tamoxifen to induce endometrial cancer and other pathologies varies between pre- and postmenopausal women. The risk of endometrial cancer in tamoxifen users was not statistically significant in women aged 49 years or younger, risk ratio of 1.42, but that there was a statistically significant increase in risk in women aged 50 years or older with a risk ratio of 5.33. Aromatase inhibitors inhibit estrogen synthesis in the peripheral tissues and have a similar tumor regressing effect to tamoxifen. They do not increase the risk of endometrial pathology or vaginal bleeding. Aromatase inhibitors have also been explored as a treatment option for endometrial hyperplasia in small observational studies with varied success. Should women on tamoxifen be treated with prophylactic progestogen therapy? There is evidence that the LNG IUS prevents polyp formation and that it reduces the incidence of endometrial hyperplasia in women on tamoxifen. The effect of the LNG IUS on breast cancer recurrence risk remains uncertain, so its routine use cannot be recommended. How should women who develop endometrial hyperplasia while on tamoxifen treatment for breast cancer be managed? The need for tamoxifen should be reassessed and management should be according to the histological classification of endometrial hyperplasia and in conjunction with the women's oncologist. The partial agonist action of tamoxifen in the genital tract is associated with an increased risk of endometrial cancer. In the presence of hyperplasia, it is presumed that this risk is even higher. Therefore, the use of tamoxifen should be reassessed in conjunction with the women's oncologist and an alternative treatment saw if appropriate. In the absence of evidence specific to this group of women, it is reasonable to treat them according to their histological classification of hyperplasia. How should endometrial hyperplasia confined to an endometrial polyp be managed? Complete removal of the uterine polyp or polyps is recommended and an endometrial biopsy should be obtained to sample the background endometrium. Subsequent management should be according to the histological classification of endometrial hyperplasia. Endometrial polyps are discrete overgrowths of endometrium and atypia may be restricted to foci within the polyp. In the absence of background endometrial hyperplasia, it seems reasonable to assume that removal of the polyp may be curative. It is also important to ensure 
that histological analysis of the background endometrium is performed even if the endometrium looks healthy on hysteroscopy. Women with atypical hyperplasia in a polyp were slightly more likely to have hyperplasia in the surrounding endometrium than those with hyperplasia without atypia. Following removal of the polyp, management should be according to the histological classification of endometrial hyperplasia. Appendix number 2 Algorithm for the Management of Endometrial Hyperplasia